Hello and welcome to the video. Today we're going to be talking about radio control protocols, specifically the ones that the receiver talks to whatever else is inside the model, be that servos, speed controllers, flight controllers, flight stabilizers, or whatever it is that you have in there. Now I get lots of questions by pilots either coming into a new part of the hobby, if they've been flying for a long time, or coming into the hobby straight into the world of flight controllers, INAV, beta flights, RD pilot, and there's a lot of information around the forum, some of it is quite old. And because I get so many questions, I thought it would be useful to put it all together and talk about what the protocols are, talk a little bit about things like telemetry too, and give you my recommendations for if you're starting a build now, where I go to. Now this is kind of a companion to one that I did a little while ago that was talking about ESC protocols explained because that's a very similar thing. There's been a huge amount of uh, innovation around these kind of things in the past 8 to 10 years. So it means that if you're looking in forums, particularly if you're not looking at something that's very current, it can become confusing because something that's three or four years ago might be raving about one thing, where now if you look at an updated post, it'll be raving about something else. A couple of caveats before we get into this. Radio control protocols are changing all the time. I'm recording this in June of 2023. Who knows what the standards will be and the common choices in two or three years' time. So if you're watching it in two or three years' time, these information in here may be out of date. However, two of the protocols that I'm going to talk about at the end, which are my go-to choices, I can't see changing anytime soon. Most of the newer flight control protocols that the receiver talks to other things inside a model that are digital are designed really for things like flight controllers. So things like SBUS and CRSF and Mavlink and other things that we're going to talk about in a moment are really there for if you have a flight controller or a stabilizer or something else that's expecting to talk to the receiver over a digital link. And the great thing about some of the modern, the latest stuff, the protocols that are around, is they are two-way. Not only can you send the positions of the controls on the radio to the, something like a flight controller or stabilizer, but crucially, the flight controller or stabilizer can send telemetry back to your radio so you can have information displayed on your screen. And that's incredibly powerful because it means if you accidentally lose sight of the model or something happens to the FPV feed if you're flying, you can actually fly the model with that virtual cockpit and get things like your speed, altitude, battery status, current drawn, all that kind of stuff. So let's get into the slides and talk about the one that most people bump into when they start in the hobby, flying things like fixed wing. So PWM is the granddaddy of all of this, pulse width modulation. Now pulse width modulation, let's call it PWM because it's fractionally easier to say, is the one that most people will be familiar with if they've been in the hobby historically. It has three wires that go into each of the outputs, so on a receiver like this you'll see that the, all these pins are actually set into groups of three. There's a ground pin, a plus five volt pin typically, and a signal pin. And into those pins we'll plug in things like servos or things like ESCs or electronic speed controllers. PWM is one of the standards and the way it works is it sends a pulse along the cable and the length of that pulse is the size of the signal. So it's a little bit weird. What you kind of have to do is if you listen to these three beeps, what value do they represent? Well, you have to be able to time them exactly. So hopefully you've got a really accurate stopwatch and a very accurate thumb. And that's one of the issues with PWM is that the receiver end or the servo or the speed controller has to be able to very accurately measure the pulse that comes along the wire coming from your receiver. And that's why it's common to have things like calibration or setting midpoints for servos and things like that in PWM land. The other issue is, is that it isn't particularly fast. You know, 50 hertz is standard for analog servos. Maybe 100, 150 hertz update speeds is okay for digital servos. It's not super quick and it's only one way. And the big disadvantage, of course, is that everything you plug into the receiver has to have its own set of those three pins. So if you want to have eight servos connected and two speed controllers, you've got to have a receiver that has a whopping 10 PWM outputs, or because each of those need three pins, your receiver has to have room for 30 pins on it so that you can connect everything up. 
And this is still very widely used in things like cars, boats, and planes and stuff without a flight controller. It's a great way to put its systems together without lots and lots of complexity. Now, when flight controllers came along, initially we were doing exactly the same. So we were connecting the aileron using a three-wire cable, and then we were connecting the elevator using a three-wire cable, the throttle with a three-wire cable, and it just became really, really quite messy. You can see here on this very old quadcopter how many cables we had to manage. However, this next thing came along called PPM, Pulse Position Modulation. And pulse position modulation is a great way to send the signals one after the other down just one signal wire. So it was a massive improvement for those with things like flight controllers over the other systems that we had. If you had a receiver that could output a PPM stream, then you plugged that into the receiver. The other end of the cable you plugged into your flight controller and told the flight controller it was PPM. However, it's still an analog signal. There's lots of little pulses and the pulses travel one after the other, starting with channel one and going through right to the end of the channel. So channel one, two, three, four, five, etc. So you still have the issues with potentially the pulses need to be measuring very accurately and you still have the issue that it's all analog. So all the timing has to be perfect. And unfortunately, having to wait for all of the signals, all of the values to be sent before you get round robin and start again means that it's not a particularly fast protocol. However, the next innovation was one of the big ones and that is SBUS. SBUS is still one of the standards. Lots of people in the community still think it's a legacy protocol, but it is the open standard for digital signals that pretty much everything supports with the exception as I'm recording this of Express LRS, but that's a hope that's going to support it very soon. So why is SBUS so much better than PPM? Because you still need the same three wires in the ground, five volts to power the receiver typically, and one signal cable, and it's still sending all of the values across. However, this time, rather than it sending pulses that have to be measured so that you can get an idea of what all the channel values are, it's actually a digital packet that's going over the wire rather like a computer network. So this time, rather than you have to measure the pulse to figure out that the value is 1427, then why not just send as part of the signal and say channel two is 1427. And that's kind of exactly what SBUS does. A couple of massive advantages to that. First of all, you can send that information an awful lot quicker because of course in the old days, way with PPM. If all the channels had a really high value, you had to basically wait to send those long pulses and do all that stuff. With SBUS, it kind of takes the same amount of information to send the signal, no matter what the channel values are. The other thing, of course, is now we don't have to calibrate because using a digital protocol, that's kind of all taken care of because the discrete value is being sent for all the channels. You can just read it off at the other end. The other massive advantage with SBUS is that not only can you send the channel values because it's basically a packet of information, you can ins also insert and send extra information too. You can do things like error checking to make sure that the information that you've just heard is actually correct, things that computers do all the time. You can also do cool things like you can have in other flags set up, basically bits at the end that can be turned on or off, which can tell you whether or not you're in fail safe. One of the things that you had to do back in the PWM or PPM land was if you lost control of the model, maybe your radio disconnected the receiver for whatever reason, you had to set a really wacky value for one of the channels and tell the flight controller, if you hear this wacky value, it means something bad has happened. In SBUS, you don't need to do that because as soon as the connection has a problem, the failsafe bit is sent along with all the other information and that failsafe bit is read by the flight controller or stabilizer and then immediately that initiates whatever you set up the failsafe to do. So hopefully you can see here SBUS is miles ahead in terms of usability of PWM and PPM if you have flight controllers and stabilizers or other things that talk SBUS. You can also get things like SBUS uh, servos and all kinds of stuff but most of the time I run into SBUS, it's connecting a receiver to something like a flight controller. Now there are lots of other ones that you will bump into. Um, I don't tend to use any of these. The reason is that they tend to be proprietary protocols. So people will take 
the ESPL standard and try and improve it in inverted commas and make it a proprietary protocol. Uh, having a proprietary protocol isn't fantastic because it then means that everyone else has to try and figure out how to work with those protocols. Personally, I like to stick with the open standards because going down these roads can get you into a little bit of trouble because they're not as widely supported. So personally, I don't use any of these by the side, but they are available and they belong to specific manufacturers. So iBus is FlySky, Fport is FRSky, DSM and DSM2 are Spectrum protocols. Uh, three or four years ago, it was very common to have flight controllers with a little port on the side that you can plug a Spectrum satellite receiver into. Uh, these days, it's less common. And things like SumD is a Grampner system. So you will bump into them occasionally. And if you are using all of their kits, then there's a chance it'll all work together. But abroad, the wider hobby, they're less used, so investing in them means that potentially you're going to bump into problems. So we've talked a little bit then about how you get the signals from the receiver in the model into your servos or ESCs or your flight controller or flight stabilizer. What about then that other thing that I've mentioned, which is the telemetry? How do you get telemetry back down to your radio or even a PC? Well, there's lots of different options that you'll bump into for that. Let me talk about some of the most common ones. One of the most common ones is something called SmartPort. SmartPort is something that FreeSky develops and is on that receiver that we were looking at before. There's a SmartPort port uh, on the end of the flight controller. And this is a very common way that lots of us used to fly five, six, seven years ago that we would have the S-Bus side of it plugged into the flight controller and then we configure telemetry going back into the receiver via the smart port pin. There's also something called Mavlink. Mavlink is something that has been developed over in the Pixhawk and Ardu pilot side of the hobby. It's a very robust two cable system so typically this would be plugged into a UART again just like the smart port would so you would have two connections to your flight controller one for your S bus and then one for your smart port with Mavlink you can also use it for radio control but the fact it has two wires a receive and transmit pin means that you can also send data to the flight controller over this telemetry link too and that's where it gets really powerful you can use things like telemetry radios and have the live telemetry displayed on your computer because as far as your computer is concerned the radio link just looks like a really 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 long usb cable last one to talk about then which is one of the darlings of the hobby is crsf not to be confused with crossfire crossfire is a radio system developed by Team Black Sheep. CRSF is the protocol that the receiver talks to the flight controller with. Again, this is four wires. So you have a ground, five volts, and you have a transmit and receive pin. And that's going to be plugged into a UR on your flight controller. And it sends the radio control information, you know, the position of all your radio controls to the flight controller. But it also receives all the telemetry back and sends it down to the radio. It's an incredibly fast robust, brilliant system that TBS developed that's used in their Crossfire, also in their TBS Tracer radio system, but also now has been adopted by Express LRS, which is the new open standard that no one vendor owns, which is why all of us pilots really love it. And that means then that CRSF, using those four connections, power, ground, transmit and receive, you have all the connections that you need and it's an, again a digital signal so it's like s bus on steroids with smart port with lots of other goodies involved too so we've talked there about another radio control protocol crsf so what is crsf well i think crsf going forward is going to become one of the go-to standards for the hobby i need to give a big thank you for trappy for not getting all litigious with the express lrs project when they essentially copied the CRSF protocol. It is probably the default way that I would recommend that people set up stuff. Now, most flight controllers will have specific UARTs and ports now that you would plug in a CRSF uh, receiver. Most pilots who are coming into the hobby now are being advised to go with an Express LRS receiver. Or uh, if you're not using Express LRS, if you're using something like TBS Crossfire, then by connecting those four wires and turning telemetry on, configuring your flight controller for CRSF, you get a really robust system. 
So if you are looking to build something right now, what should you go for? Well, I think it's becoming pretty clear, hopefully from the tone of the video so far. I would recommend if you have the option to use something like a CRSF protocol with something like Express LRS, uh, a TBS Crossfire, or something like the Tracer system, that's what I would go for. You get the telemetry back down to your radio, you get the radio control signals sent from the little receiver into the flight controller. It is fast, reliable, and it has lots of really cool features like a dynamically built menu system. I'm not going to get into now, but it just means there's lots of stuff in there that kind of future-proof it. And it's the reason why the Express LRS team picked it as the protocol that their receivers talked. The other one then is good old SBUS. SBUS is still a very widely supported open standard. It's very rare to find a piece of equipment these days that doesn't at least support SBUS. And although uh, for a long time the Express LRS team have viewed SBUS as a legacy protocol, there is so much stuff out there that only understands SBUS and PPM without one wire connection, particularly things like flight stabilizers for airplanes, that you know what? It's crazy that that project took so long to support it. So for me, these are the two options. These days, if I'm building something, if I have a spare receiver that talks SBUS and maybe we'll have a smart port connection on it for telemetry, I'll use that just to use it up. But if it's a new thing, I really would probably grab something like an Express LRS receiver running CRSF and use that instead. So hopefully that's been useful for those of you that have been trying to figure this out. It explains a little bit of what these things are and how it all works. The nice thing about CRSF is that with those four wires, you can both get the telemetry and the radio control stuff just using one UART. With using something like SBUS and a separate telemetry connection, then you're essentially using two UARTs tying up two hardware ports for that all to work, which is why I think going forward, CRSF is probably going to become the default way that most of us do it. If you have any questions, pop them down below, but hopefully now that all makes a little more sense. Thank you for watching the video. If you watch my videos and find them useful, then please take a moment to hit the like and subscribe button. It helps the channel a lot. If you really like what I'm doing here, you can become a Patreon and support the time I spend helping others and get access to lots of exclusive benefits. Link is in the video description. Remember that all the videos on the channel are organized into playlists, so you can easily use those playlists to find all the videos on a subject that you are interested in. Add Painless360 to your searches on Google and YouTube, and it'll help you find my content for any particular topic. Thanks again for watching, and as always, happy flying.